I'm Jerry Brown, and uh, this is my co-author and wife, Julie Brown. Uh, she has taken all of the photos of psychedelic mushrooms in Christian art that we are going to present to you today from our tour and our sabbatical research in Europe and the Middle East. Um, she is also the reason uh, that Don Latin, the author of the Harvard Psychedelic Club, called our book, It's the Da Vinci Code Meets the Electric Acid Kool-Aid Test. <laughs> so it's very readable. So I just wanted you to know who Julie was, and uh, we'll be having our book available after the talk. Um, Julie is a psychotherapist. She has a lot more psychedelic experience than I do, and she's one of the few people I know who truly had a cosmic consciousness experience, which is described in our book. I'm an anthropologist by training. Uh, my work prior to this has been in social movements, uh, nuclear power, renewable energy. And today we're going to present to you direct and indirect evidence of psychoactive mushrooms in Christian art. All of the newer information that we're talking about will be uh, available in a peer-reviewed article that's going to come out in the a special issue of the Journal of Psychedelic Studies, which will appear at the end of this month. It's a special issue on psychedelics in history and world religions. Lily Tomlin, the comedian, said, reality is a crutch for people who can't handle drugs. <laughs> And um, let's see what's happening here. Oh, I'm not connected. So uh, Albert Hoffman was not prepared to handle his first LSD trip. In fact, uh, he felt that he was uh, going to another place um, another time. Was I dying? My first LSD experience in the uh, Rocky Mountains uh, National Park at a Rainbow Family Gathering in 1973 I didn't feel I was dying, but I was sort of spun into a Don Juan-esque shamanistic world that really frightened me. I thought at times I was losing my mind. Uh, fortunately, I was able to pull myself out of that, but as an anthropologist and a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, I decided to design and teach a course on psychedelics and culture. Well, how did we get that credit course into the catalog? Well, we wrote the catalog. So we were able to put it in. At that time, <coughs> I went to my union representative and I said, Bob, uh, I'm teaching a course on psychedelics and culture. Can I talk about, this is 1970s, Nixon, Leary is the most dangerous man in America, Controlled Substances Act of 1970. And my union representative said, no, not if you want to keep your job. And I said, well, what about having students uh, talk about their own experience? He says, that would be worse. So I said, I guess field work is out. He said, absolutely. Uh, I just want to make a historical note that when uh, one of Nixon's two henchmen from the Watergate years revealed not so long ago that they knew that these drugs were non-addictive, they knew they were not dangerous. They got banned because the Nixon administration had two problems. One, they had a civil rights movement and one, the other, they had an, a vigorous anti-war movement. They knew they could not make it illegal to be black, and they could not make it illegal to protest. So they controlled all of these substances as a way to invade the anti-war and the civil rights movement and put a lot of people in jail. Um, I'm not going to go, oh, I have to remember this. Um, Back in 1962, Walter Pankey, a graduate student of Timothy Leary's, uh, did a study called The Miracle of Marsh Chapel, also known as the Good Friday Experiment. And basically, they took two groups of divinity students, gave one uh, psilocybin, the other niacin as a control. No one knew who was getting what. Nine out of the 10 students, divinity students on psilocybin, had a mystical experience, including Houston Smith, who became a famous professor of religion, who said it was the most powerful homecoming, cosmic homecoming, I've ever experienced. Now I understand what I've been studying in the Bible for so long. What is amazing here is this was the beginning, and uh, Walter Clark uh, from the American Psychological Association had this comment to say. Rick Doblin, the founder of MAPS, for his PhD thesis, did a 25-year follow-up study 
and he found that seven of the ten students who had the mystical experience said it was either still the most significant experience in their life or one of the most significant experiences. Roland Griffith, the godfather of the psychedelic renaissance, replicated this at Johns Hopkins University in the early 2000s. So what we have here is the incredible phenomena of scientists being able to predictably and regularly induce a mystical experience. Oh, put this away. And these mystical experiences, the strength of the mystical experience is directly correlated to the incredibly efficient results they're getting in using this with psycho, uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. This is obviously what was attractive to people in early times for taking psychedelics as an inspiration for religious mystical experience. How did we come to this particular study? On a 20th anniversary trip to Scotland, we were in Edinburgh and drawn by Dan Brown's description in the Da Vinci Code of Roslyn Chapel, just south of Edinburgh, as a possible resting place of the Holy Grail, we went to Roslyn. Roslyn is more Gaudi than Gothic. It is a fusion of pagan and Catholic symbolism. It is a Catholic church. But there are also a, over 100 green men heads uh, throughout Roslyn Chapel. And this is one of them. This is the most prominent one. It comes down over the altar from a stone boss from the ceiling, and it hangs down. It is in the most sacred place in Roslyn, and I was fascinated. This is one of a hundred. I was fascinated by it. I bought a plaster replica of this Roslyn green man, and about two weeks later, Julie and I are sitting in an uh, Italian restaurant in St. Andrews. I turn it around on the table, and there I see a replica of the life cycle of an Amanita muscaria mushroom, the bulb, the veil, and then, which is hard to see in here, the dotted top. This started us thinking, why did Sir William St. Clair, who constructed and designed everything in Roslyn, put a psychoactive mushroom in this church in the 15th century? Was this something unique to maybe Roslyn and Sir William St. Clair? Could there be other psychoactive mushrooms in Christian art? Does Christianity have a psychedelic history? Could this go back to the time of Jesus and the disciples? I mean, what were they talking about? Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. I'm sure uh, Jesus was not inspiring people to cannibalism, which would have been anathema to Romans and Jews alike. So now uh, our mind was kind of rushing towards a rambunctious overthrow of reason, and we paused. And we stopped and we thought about two things. Carl Sagan's principle, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If we're going to go out and develop a hypothesis about psychoactive mushrooms in Christian art, we better have extraordinary compelling evidence. I also thought about my favorite professor of anthropology, symbolic anthropology, at Cornell University, Victor Turner, who hailed from Manchester, England, who always said, good theory comes from good fieldwork. Go out and gather the data. And after going back and forth in 2012, this is what we did. We traveled to Scotland, to England, to Canterbury, to France, to Chartres, to the center of France, to small chapels, abbeys, and uh, churches. We went into the mid-Pyrenees. We went to Hildesheim in Germany, to St. Michael's Church. Uh, we went to the Basilica of Aquileia uh, in the northwest, in the northeast of Italy, where we found uh, evidence of psychoactive mushrooms from 300 AD. There's no Christian art, there's no datable Christian art before 200 AD because of persecution poverty, etc. We went to the Vatican museums, no examples of psychoactive mushrooms in Christian art, but they start in the 1400s. We went to Eleusis in Greece, and then we went to Turkey, to Cappadocia, to the open air cave churches, and also to the Alhara Valley, where Christians fled from Roman persecution as early as the first century. Starting here, in the center of France, 
in a small chapel, a uh, chapel of Plain Corralt in France. This is a fresco. It's from 1291. And how many of you know, have heard of R. Gordon Wasson? Uh, John Marco Allegro. So this was, became the epicenter of an epic battle about the future of the study of psychedelics in Christianity between John Marco Allegro, who wrote The Sacred Mushrooms and the Cross that appeared in 1970, who said that Christianity evolved out of a mushroom cult. And R. Gordon Wasson, a former J.P. Morgan banker, who became the, the founder of modern ethnomycology, who said, no, evidence of psychoactive mushrooms in the Near East ends 1000 BC. But Wasson had to deal with this fly agaric in the ointment. This is from 1291. And as you can see, that looks a lot like an Amanita muscaria mushroom. It has, it's red. This is an original photograph. We have not altered it. We enhanced it to bring out the color and the contrast. And Wasson famously quoted a letter from Erwin Panofsky, seen as the most influential art historian in the 20th century, said, no, 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 that's a stylized Italian pine tree. <laughs> what Wasson never revealed, and what Julie and I found in the Wasson archives at the Harvard University Herbarium, where all of Wasson's papers and articles and artifacts and letters with Robert Graves are, was a second letter from Panofsky where he said, well, maybe it could be a mushroom if some ignorant craftsman actually misunderstood and painted a mushroom there. Wasson prevailed, and he did incredible studies. He's the one who identified the Amanita muscaria as the soma of the Hindu Rig Veda and the urine drinking of the Siberian reindeer herders was a key part of that for the biochemistry of uh, ebotenic acid and muscimol in Amanita muscaria. He wrote with Albert Hoffman about the ergot that is at the base of the Kikion in the Eleusinian mysteries, which were practiced for 2,000 years. He brought the work, for better of, or worse, of Maria Sabina, the Mazatec shamaness, to public view and recorded her veladas and participated in them. And he documented the Siberian reindeer herders long term, the fathers of shamanism practice of using Amanita muscaria. So I, as a student of this and using his case studies in my classes, I bought hook, line, and sinker Wasson's view that this doesn't exist into Christianity until we came upon the green man. Allegro's career went down in flames after the sacred mushroom in the cross because he said Jesus was not a historical figure. He was just a metaphor for the mushroom. He used speculative linguistic uh, analysis of ling ancient linguistics uh, to make his case, which did not stand up. And he was admittedly on a crusade to break the thrall of cri that Christianity had over the masses. We are completely different in our view. We believe Jesus was a historical figure. We rely on plausible uh, evidence that ethnobotanists have identified of psychoactive mushrooms. And we are not out to destroy anyone's faith in Christianity, but as, to reintroduce people to a mystery that's at the base of many religions. If you look closely at the Amanita muscaria here, you'll notice a couple of things. The obvious one, this is not a diminutive little mushroom. In um, this area, er, epic of art, size matters. And obviously, this is as large as Adam and Eve. The artist is trying to tell us something. The Benedictine monks um, who controlled Plankerol are trying to tell us something. Number two, there are two historical moments, as you often find in art of this period together. One, there is the temptation. But if you look closely, you'll see that Eve is skeletonized. She is obviously going through 
a transformation. She has obviously ingested something. It is obviously not an apple that's taking her on this journey and skeletonization as Merce Eliade, the great uh, anthropologist of shamanism, indicated, is one of the fundamental things of shamanism because the bones can last 30, 40, 50,000 years and she's going through a process of birth and rebirth. We do not think this is about the fall and I'm just going to say this, uh, we discuss it in our book, uh, but the fall of this being about the fall and the temptation, that's a New Testament interpretation. What we believe is really going on here because God said, if you eat of this fruit, then surely you shall die. But they didn't die, and they didn't kill them. We believe this is about Eve, not being the temptress who brought humanity into sin, but as being the courageous woman who exercised free will and led humanity to higher consciousness by eating of the fruit, which the serpent said, this will make you like God's. This is now over uh, about 50 miles from uh, Plain Corralt. This is uh, Saint Sauvain, uh, Saint Martin de Vic. It's a church. It's a small church. It has an incredible series of frescoes. And as we walked in here again, you have two historical moments now divided by a great span of time. Uh, here is Isaiah, uh, 700 years before Christ. Uh, he's supposed to have his lips purified by burning coals. Those are not burning coals, hard to see. And here's Jesus entering Jerusalem, and Julie grabbed my arm and she said, oh, do you see what I see? Yes, five large, tan, smooth, psilocybin mushrooms. If this were not enough, Jesus is going towards the Tower of Jerusalem and painted on the uh, next wall, and this is all photographs, color photographs in our book, are the Amanita muscar, um, the psilocybin mushrooms, and with these long knives, they're cutting them down from the towers of Jerusalem. And that painting is right over the Last Supper. This is not a Seder. There is no wine on the table. And the same knives that were used to cut down the mushrooms are on the table. And if you look very closely, you will see here in the hems of the disciples are mushroom images. It got dark in the church. The bells were ringing and Julie and I had the aha moment. This is an alternative gospel. There, this is not hidden, it's there, available for those who have eyes to see. And just as Pope Gregory, the father of Christian worship, said, let art be the Bible of the illiterate. Let us instruct people through the artwork. This is, and I'm going to show you, how's our time going? Ten minutes? Uh, show you very quickly some of the other images that are in our book. This is from the Great Canterbury Psalter, an illuminated Bible, 1180 from the Canterbury Scriptorum where Bibles were made. And here we see God creating plants. Oh, actually God is creating psychoactive mushrooms. There's a red and white Amanita. And here is a blue psilocybin because, as you know, psilocybin, when it's scratched and oxidizes, turns characteristically blue. Um, also found in the Canterbury Psalter, very interesting, Jesus healing the, the leper. And uh, the leper is saying, Master, if you will, cleanse me. And Jesus' scroll, which we had translated by a classical scholar, uh, is saying, I will be cleansed. But the leper's scroll is not going to Jesus. It's going to this psilocybin-like mushroom showing the role of psilocybin in healing. And we remember healing, divination, uh, divine experience. These were all things that we find in shamanism and certainly in early religion. This is the conversion. We went to Chart Cathedral, 174 stained glass windows on two tiers. Difficult to photograph, but thank God for a telescopic lens. This is from the conversion of, of uh, St. Eustace. And we see he's surrounded by mushrooms here and here. And we see this cross between the antlers of the stag. Ethnobotanist Giorgio Samarini has traced this image all the way back to Tunisia in the 5th and 6th century, where you had a mushroom with either stags or lions on each side of it. And again, we see the illumination 
of uh, conversion coming down from heaven. This one, so now, we've, as we looked at these things in center France, we asked ourselves, well, what's really going on? Are these some hippie priests cavorting out in the forest, far from the control of crown and king? So let's go to the high holy places of Christendom. And that's certainly the Canterbury Psalter. Sh uh, Chartres Cathedral, also a UNESCO site. Hildesheim, often we don't know who made this art. Was it the painters, the craftsmen? Was it the priests who gave them instructions? Was it the patrons who funded this particular church? Was it all three working together? Here in the case of St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany, we know who did this. This was St. Bernard at the turn of the century, who was the tutor to Otto III, the Holy Roman Emperor. He became a saint of the Catholic Church. This is no marginal priest cavorting off in the forest. He was a church builder, a mathematician, and a metallurgist. He cast a huge bronze door showing psilocybin mushrooms. He cast a bronze Christ column called the Millennial Column at the turn of the century. 12 feet high, over two feet in diameter, showing the life of Christ from the baptism to his entry into Jerusalem. And at five different stages, his instruction of the, Bible, of the disciples, there are psilocybin mushrooms, which Giorgio Samarini said, these are the St. Savant type mushrooms. Unlike plain Keralt, they have striations, they have ribs along the side, and they have this nipple on the top, sort of looking very much like the common liberty cap mushroom uh, found in Europe. This is fantastically interesting because it's the transfiguration of Jesus, one of two miracles in the Bible that happened to Jesus rather than Jesus doing them. In this case, God, the disciples are there, ancient um, biblical figures emerge, and God graces Jesus and he says to the, the disciples, hear him, he is my son, my only son, hear him well. 200 years later, the descendants of St. Bernard, after he was canonized, created a Jesse tree, 90 foot long ceiling drawing, indicating the evolution from the Garden of Eden all the way up to Christ as the new Adam and Eve. And we start out with a rondelette of an Amanita cap described as golden apples. And you can see here that Eve is holding an Adam. This is not just a pattern. Adam is holding uh, a, one of the apples here. This is not, we believe in the long term, uh, incompatible with Christianity. We quote in our book, Brother David Stendel Rost of the Order of St. Benedict, who says the following. If we can encounter God through a sunrise seen from a mountaintop, why not through a mushroom prayerfully ingested? These are all God's creations. And we see with Santo Deme and the UDV in Ayahuasca in Brazil, which has been endorsed by the Brazilian Council of Bishops, that psychoactive substances can obviously be compatible with Christian worship. In our book, we deal with several critiques, the ignorance of art historians who wouldn't know a mushroom if they saw one. And yesterday in his presentation, Giorgio Samarini showed why the archaeologists could not see the psychoactive substances hundreds and thousands of years ago and why it takes ethnobotanists to see it. We have to be wary of the over-enthusiasm of ardent, ardent advocates like Jan Irwin and John Rush who see mushrooms everywhere. That is a danger in this field. And the oversimplification of some medieval historians who can't see a mushroom anywhere. Lastly, we see that there is the beginning of an opening, thank to, thanks to Michael Pollan's book, with conservative Catholics who are saying, look, it's time we had a, a new conversation in psychedelics. Psychedelics heal people. We are for that. Psychedelics create mystical experience. We are for that. Let's have a new discussion about psychedelics. We haven't gotten any response from the Catholic Church, um, but, but uh, we would welcome it. The significance of our work, it resolves the Wasson Allegro controversy. We found the surprising reason 
why Wasson, who was an indefatigable researcher, avoided going into Christianity. It will surprise you. It's in our book. Number two, we put forth this hypothesis. It is not a definitive solution. It is a controversial hypothesis, and therefore we have called for the formation of an interdisciplinary committee on the psychedelic gospels to independently review, evaluate, look at these images, look for imi uh, presence of, of psychoactive mushrooms in religious texts back from this period. We think this is another contribution to the role of psychedelics in world religions. We think this has been a sacrament in early Christianity, and we quote some passages from the Gnostic Gospels and from Jesus himself that can be interpreted through psychedelic eyes as talking about this. And finally, we talk about uh, entheogens uh, in the future of religion. I'd like to come to conclude a little bit here with a quote from uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, my second favorite uh, German language author. Rilke is my first. It's, ca it's called A Dream. Ein Traum, ein Traum ist unser Leben auf Erden hier. Wie Schatten auf dem Woben schweben und schwinden wir. Wir sind, doch wissen es nicht, in Mitte der Ewigkeit. A dream, a dream is our life here on Earth. We are, we rise, we fall like um, foam on the waves. We are, but know it not, in the middle of eternity. I think that what psychedelics have shown us is we're not in the middle of eternity. We're part of the fabric of eternity, and we are a manifestation of the infinite conversing with each other. I think that uh, watching from the 60s and 70s and seeing the emergence of this incredible psychedelic renaissance, we should look at ourselves like the cathedral builders who are laying the foundations of a psychedelic reformation that will continue far into the future. Uh, Julie and I live in Portugal now. We are available to speak on these uh, topics, either in person or remotely, Zoom and, and Skype. We'd be happy to do that. And here is where uh, you can contact us, uh, my email address, and Psychedelic Gospels. We're also on Facebook, Psychedelic Gospels. And we'll also have books available right outside uh, after the presentation. Is that timing good? Oh, so we have two more minutes? Yes. Uh, so what I want to say uh, also, coming back here, we talk about the Psychedelic Gospels as one of our topics. We talk about psychedelics for passion and purpose. How psychedelics helped us find passion at work in our life. How psychedelics helped us choose love over fear, me particularly, <laughs> um, in um, getting together in our relationship. And how psychedelics helped me uh, when I went into a deep depression, uh, ayahuasca particularly, come out of that depression. The psychedelic renaissance and the decriminalization movement in the United States is a very powerful movement. We have the ability that I don't think you have in Europe to have local city and state initiatives towards discriminalization. Uh, it is a model that is working, and um, one of the people from Denver Decrim is here, um, and I, I hope you get a chance to talk to him. And we also talk about entheogens in the future of religion. Thank you very much. We'll be out in the hall. <laughs>